All right, so we're spending the evening talking about change. And I want to talk about what change means to me and how literature and fiction and stories has helped me over the course of my life move through change. And as the introduction said, right now I'm teaching a climate fiction class. First time I've ever taught it. It's a lot about change, climate fiction, climate change. How are we going to deal with the crisis that is upon us? It's an uncomfortable class. But in the middle of a book, that I'm reading right now with my students, which is Gold Fame Citrus by Claire V. Watkins. There's a line that says, the ultimate project is to believe. And I think that that's one of the things that gets me through in life. The ultimate project is to believe. I'm not going to tell you what to believe, but to believe in something. And for me, the belief is in stories. So I'm going to try to hit on four things tonight. Change, blue skies, and how that relates to change. A personal change that I went through years ago, and then the role of literature in my life. When I think about change, I think about all those metaphors, change is good, change is progress, we need change, all of those things that are positive and uplifting. That's not how I experience change. In my gut, it's scary. It's anxiety producing. I don't like change. I like maps. I like schedules. I like habits. I like patterns. I like to know where I'm going. So when I hit these moments of ah, change, and I think, oh, change is good, change is going to be all right, I, I'm thinking, no, not so much. It's not. It's really scary. So then I like to think about the next thing, which is blue skies. There's a TED Talk by Andy Pudikin, and I hope I said his name right. He's got a great TED Talk on meditation. And in it, Andy talks about blue skies. And the thing about blue skies is, even when we don't think they're there, they're there. And we know this to be literally true. It's cloudy out today. I could believe that the sun is never going to shine again. But I know if I get above those clouds, it's blue skies. It is literally blue skies. Metaphorically in my life, when I'm experiencing discomfort, depression, whatever, if I can get myself to believe those blue skies are there, they're there. So it's a metaphor and it's also literal. Those blue skies are there for us. They are always there for this, us. And there's a piece of literature that I love, a lot of my friends don't love, but I love, which is Life of Pi by Jan Martel. And for those of you who haven't read it, go read it. But if you haven't read it, uh, it's about a castaway, a young boy named Pi, and he spends over 200 days adrift in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not a good time. He does not enjoy it. But at one point, he decides to have a positive attitude, to affirm his life. And he stands up in his lifeboat, and he says, this is God's hat. And he pats his pants, and he says, this is God's attire. And he points at the cat that's in the boat with him, which is very important. And he says, this is God's cat. This is God's ark. And he's affirming, and he's embracing life, and he says, this is what it is. But then in the very next paragraph, he says... But, cat, but God's hat is unraveling. God's attire is in shatters. God's cat is dangerous. And God's ark is a trap. So he's on this wave of blue skies, life is good. In the trough, life is not so good. And he just rides that through the whole book. We just watch him ride that. So I want you to hold on to that idea. What I want to do now is talk about a moment in my life that I don't talk about very much, and I certainly don't do it publicly. Um, it happened to me when I was in graduate school. As a graduate student, my life was incredibly stable, which is not the normal pattern for graduate student life. Uh, I had been married for five years. I had a teaching assistantship. I had a good job in the summer, so I was financially stable. I worked at a great restaurant. I had friends inside the academy. I had friends outside the academy. I was very balanced. Things were good. And I went through my preliminary exams, which are stressful, and there are little things. I was like, oh, this isn't going to go well. I passed them, which is a big deal, because that means then you get to write your thesis. You've, you've gone to the other side. So I'd gone to the other side. Life was good. A month later, my first husband, not my current husband, my first husband, came to me and said, 
I have to talk to you. I knew in that moment my life had changed. His body language, everything about him said, this is not good. And what he said to me was, that life that we have, it's a sham. It's a fiction. It's not real. He wasn't an art student that I thought he was. He wasn't working at an architectural firm that I thought he was. He didn't do the things during the day that I thought he did. And this is why I don't talk about this much. Because what I imagine you're thinking is, how could she not know? How could she not know? I didn't know. He was so good, he did home for, homework for classes he wasn't taking. Think about that. Homework for classes he was not taking. It was an elaborate sham. And all those metaphors that people talk about, the floor dropped out from underneath me. I was hit by a ton of bricks. My world tilted. It was hell. And I had to go forward. And I don't know what made me do this, but I did two things. One, I said yes. People asked me to do things, I said yes. Do you want to go to a sports bar and have a drink and watch a, baseball, a basketball game? Yes. I don't drink. And I don't particularly like watching sports on TV. But yes, I am there. Do you want to play softball on the graduate student program? Yes, I haven't played since second grade. I'm there, yes, I'll play. I said yes to things I would never have said yes to. I said no to a few things, but I said yes to a lot of things. Um, and it got me through. It was, I said yes, I will try this, I will explore. And at the same time I was doing that, I was teaching a new course for a new university, an introductory, introduction to literature course. I had ordered the books before the confession, the revolution, the rebellion, whatever you want to call that moment in time was, before that had happened. So I had picked a good play, a good novel, some good short stories, some good play, uh, poems. I, there wasn't a common theme. I didn't know where I was going with this stuff. I just knew that those were good materials. And then I started teaching. Every single text had at its core a lie or deception. I couldn't believe it. It's like, how did I pick this stuff? And I had to go in day after day and have an academic discussion about why does this character lie? Why does this person respond the way they do? What happens when you do this? It was awful. I hated that semester. But every day, I would go in the classroom and I would say, well, what about this lie? What do we think about this? And I worked through in a very academic way what was going on in me and in my life personally. How do you deal with lies and deceptions? Along with that, I was also getting ready to write my thesis. And I knew that there was this text that was going to be important to me, but I hadn't read it yet. And it was Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. And I knew that this was an important text for me. So I'm reading it, and I get to page 114. And I can tell you in my edition it was page 114. Because all of a sudden, Rushdie pulls a fast one. And you realize there's been this huge lie perpetrated on you, the reader. I wanted to throw the book across the room. I could not believe it. It was like, you have got to be kidding me again? Again with the lies? So I had to step back and say, all right, why would Rushdie do this? Why is this in this book? What's the character doing? And in the end, it's, bril it's a brilliant move. It's, it's the best thing he could have possibly done. And again, I had to work through that and think about it and say, okay, that makes sense. That world is coherent. It's a united world. So in all of those ways, I worked through what I was going through in my personal life through literature. And that's what literature does for me. It gives me options in climate change fiction. I can look at what's going on in the world and I can think, what are the options? How do we approach problems? What might we do? What might we do differently? What might we do so things don't go so badly? Um, and I want to take us back to Life of Pi. And at the end of Life of Pi, without revealing anything, this boy who has been on the Pacific Ocean for day after day after day gets to the end of his journey it's been a traumatic journey, a castaway for over 200 days. And he has to decide what's the better story. How is he going to live? What's he going to believe? How is he going to go forward? And I think that that's the decision that all of us have to make in some way. There's one other piece of literature I want to talk about that I always go to as one of my core stories. 
And it, I read it when I was young, um, and it's Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Uh, for those of you who have not read it, Jane is an orphan. She lived in her aunt's house for a while. Her aunt was horribly abusive, verbally, um, emotionally. And there's a moment where Jane, this Victorian character, leans over the banister and says to her aunt, your children are not fit to associate with me. Now, as an academic that has studied the book a lot as an adult, I can say there's all kinds of class, gender, structure things going on. This is a revolutionary act. But as a young reader, what I responded to was this young person taking control of her life and saying, you know what? I matter. I matter no matter what, and I decide my own value. So that's one reading I had. The later one is a much more academic reading. But in both readings, the story makes me who I am. It informs my world. It helps me go forward. That's what literature does for me. So I hope for all of you, in those moments of trial, of discomfort, of anxiety, that you take a deep breath, pick up a book, and read a story. Thank you.